On this episode of Big Boys Don't Cry, we discuss the film Amelie. You don't have to have seen the film to enjoy the podcast, but if you do listen without having seen it, just be aware there may be spoilers. Enjoy! Bonsoir, monsieur, je suis français et j'aime le cinéma. That's my little French song. <laughs> you're, looking, you're looking very French with your mustache, I must say. Yeah, I put my camera on properly so you could, you could see it. But yeah, we're, it's week three of November, so obviously it's in a good spot right now. This is the point just before it starts to get messy. <laughs> very good, very good. I, of course, have not done it because I hate charity of all kinds. You also really, really hate like men's health initiatives and anything to do with men, basically. <laughs> anything I've tried to have a conversation with Rob before being like, Oh, I want to talk about men's issues. Not interested. N- I never hate, hates men's health. <laughs> I the never magazine. do anything about any sort of men's <laughs> health initiatives. Yeah. Um there's rumours going around that I did a lot around men's mental health historically. Um complete fabrication. Are you never going on the record happened. now to say that that's a lie? I'm going on the record now to say that I have never done any awareness training around men's mental health. <laughs> never happened. Never formed part of your professional career or been something that you're <laughs> passionate about or something no. you've run lots of events for or anything. Absolutely not. That's a complete fabrication. You'll read about it in The Guardian tomorrow. I'll release a statement. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to all the major news outlets covering that one. Breaking news, Rob Gordon does not care about men. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe he said that. And Elon Musk is going to come for you on Twitter. <laughs> he's he's going to be livid. Actually, no, he he's he's really into free speech, so he's going to tell you to say that more and to say no, it in a nasty way as well. The problem, of course, of Elon Musk and free speech is that he only cares about certain people's free speech, which is racists and transphobes. Yeah, basically anyone who wants to say something nasty. Yeah. Hate speech. Whereas if I say something like I don't care about men, he'd see that as being a, a woke um, soy boy beta cuck statement. Oh, right. And, and then he'd ban me. That, that's the way it works. So you're making a statement here now that it's woke to not care about men. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 woke to not care about men. That's what I'm saying. Right. That's if definitely what be... <laughs> Movember's all about. <laughs> if you want to be woke, you've got to just despise men. That's that's. <laughs> Sorry, I yeah. don't make the rules. That's true, actually. Yeah. If you want to be woke, <laughs> you have to despise all men apart from us. <laughs> yeah, the big boys. We're the only good men. The big boys are the men. Big, we're trust. not men. We're big boys. Exactly. We're the big boys. We're your big boys, and we're French. <laughs> they're grand, they're grand garçons. <laughs> they're grand garçons. We. Oui. <laughs> so, um, this week's movie is Amelie, a French film. Have we done a French film before? I, we must have done at some point. Surely. I feel like we must have done, but I don't think that we have. If I'm honest, we we must have. We, we we must have done a French movie at some point, surely. Because you like you love French films, don't you? You as a you as a child spent some time in France. Often I've, went to France. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, everyone I, English, I think, has been to France at some <laughs> at time some in point. their life. But like, <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, I, I think a lot of us from the from the south of of England, um, obviously, have that very quick connection over. Just hop on a ferry or whatever from from Calais. Um, but yeah, I I spent a lot of time in France when I was younger and developed a, a big love of French culture and French cinema. Um, obviously, the greatest movie of them all was um, Jean-Luc Godard's A Bout de Souffle, which we should talk about at some point. I don't know if I've ever have seen ever, it. Have you ever seen Breathless? No, I don't believe I have. No. It is very funny to watch through a modern lens, although at the time that it came out, it was very groundbreaking. There's some very, very funny bits in it to watch as a modern as a modern viewer right Um, but we should watch it at some point it's a love triangle crime drama type thing is it a shit piece no it's genuinely well (laughs) it's a it's it's a really groundbreaking movie that i think maybe doesn't hold up as well as some other films from the era um but it did a lot of groundbreaking stuff as a as as a film yeah. Um, so we should, we should. I don't think I've ever actually seen any of his films. I think I just read a lot about him and have heard a lot of criticism. 
And I said, I'm aware of people, the position that he people occupies. People calling him a cuck. <laughs> Is yeah, that what you mean by criticism? Yeah. yeah, which I mean, I mean, came from us based on nothing. <laughs> based on nothing. It's a, it's an no, interesting... based on a few reviews I've read of film socialism, which is supposed to be terrible. It's it's an interesting movie um, that did a lot of groundwork for modern filmmaking. So if you're right. watching it from a like an idea of where film direction went after this point it's a very interesting film so we should do it at some point but there's also some very very funny moments like um a giant disembodied head appearing in the sky is is extremely funny in one scene but i won't say when because we will watch it at some point but um but yeah but this, don't, don't spoil it for me but, but we're not going to be talking about a buddha souffle today we're going to be talking about mle um Emily famously directed by the director of alien resurrection which is, i know <laughs> I don't know if I knew that until today when I, was I, really? with, I just finished watching the film and I was doing the, all the kind of background research. I said, he directed Alien Resurrection. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, the thing is that he directed two sort of weird dystopian movies. He directed Delicatessen. We're talking about Jean-Pierre Genet here. Um, he directed Delicatessen and The City of Lost Children. Um, and I think off the back of them, clearly they thought this is a really bold director to take on Alien, um, which was partly right, because Alien Resurrection is a very bold movie. <laughs> have, have you ever seen Alien Resurrection? I don't think I have, no. I've seen the first two, and then I've seen Alien vs. Predator randomly. <laughs> You've seen... Because that ha- was one that happened to be around when you're 17 and you go to the cinema and you see what's on. Sure, yeah. Um, you've seen the two good alien movies and then you've seen one of the worst ones <laughs> but i've got i've got a soft spot in my in my heart for alien versus predator there's something very silly fun about it um but alien 3 was seen as like the worst movie ever until alien resurrection came along although personally speaking and this is where i'm going to get cancelled by alien fans um alien resurrection is probably my third favorite alien movie out of all of them um after after alien, alien then alien and aliens two. yeah which aliens yeah. that's the one um alien one is would probably be in my top 10 it's, it's so a great good. film truly brilliant and aliens is a really great blend of action and horror um lots of people talk about it being an action movie but i think actually the horror presence of it is really really good too and i think people don't give it enough credit um but actually, Alien Resurrection is an extremely weird movie. It's it's all about, like, clones, everything's goopy, all of the direction's really strange. Um, it's a goop fest. It's a goop. <laughs> it's a goop fest, a certified I mean, It's, it's goop five fest. years after Alien 3, I see. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting movie that feels very out of place from the rest of the Alien films. But I think... I think it's more fun than people give it credit for, and I think it's better than people give it credit for. So I, I think I'm going to say here more people should watch Alien Resurrection with an open mind. Um, but well, especially now that you know that the director directed Amelie, yeah, which is just, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's such a and I love that actually. I think that's really good. I think you know the the directors who get mocked the most are the ones who just do the same thing over and over. Yeah, whereas I, I love a director who goes all over the place, tries different things. Yeah. And, you know, whatever you think of James Cameron, he's tried to do lots of very, very different things in his career. I say tried. He hasn't always succeeded. But, <laughs> but you know, but he's when you think turned about his hand it, to a lot of different things. When you think about it, he's had an awful lot of success based on the variety of things that he's done. Um, the, um, you know, when you think about James Cameron, the big failure that he's had was Abyss, The Abyss, which is one of my favourite James Cameron movies in terms of like it being a financial failure sort of but you think about the other movies that he's made you know he's three times held the record for the most successful movie of all time (laughs) you know and this is someone who's hopped from you know horror to action to romance to blue people um which is a genre in its own right of course (laughs) and blue people and secretly i want the avatar movies to do well 
not yeah the, there's a, the new one there's a new one coming i haven't seen the original i was gonna do the original one next on the show but you know i've had to choose you've something had else to choose. We'll, we'll get on to, <laughs> you've had to choose something <laughs> my else. hand has been forced by fate i yeah. choose something else but there's a poster for the new avatar that i've seen and it looks it looks quite ps2 robert zemeckis <laughs> so i'm quite enjoying that i know and that that's the thing about it is that when the first avatar came out it was a really brown groundbreaking movie from a technical perspective the way that it did 3d was truly very impressive but the movie that was wrapped around it wasn't particularly interesting so i'm kind of wondering how good is avatar 2 really going to be if it doesn't have that same and i think they have done a lot of work on the technical side of things here but is it going to hit as powerfully now as when the first one came out um and part of me wants it to do well to spite marvel um, yeah, of course. <laughs> that's, a, that's a factor. That's never a bad thing. But I'd also quite like it to not do quite well enough to warrant James Cameron spending all of his time on Avatar sequels until he dies. Yeah, I'd, I want him to try and do something else. I'd quite like him to do something different again after this movie. So, a musical. Yeah, or or like a a, a western. I don't think he's ever done a western. Yeah, or a proper swashbuckler. Yeah, exactly. Like, like a Zorro style swords clacking swashbuckler. Or a rom com. <laughs> yeah. Just or just a, a straight up rom com. Just a straight up rom com with James Cameron's like take on it. I I'd love him to do in French. I'd love him to do something something different. But of course we're we're not here talking about, about Avatar. No. But the point is made that I think that a a director who can turn their hand successfully to many things is a great thing, and I think Jean Pierre Genet is brilliant in that respect. Even though yeah. I've n I don't think I've actually seen any of the rest of his work, I know that it's successful. And the the idea I think you can almost tell when you watch a film by a good director, can't you? Like a film that's good, like Amelie, that makes sense that works on a number of different levels and does interesting and different things, you think, yeah, I could see that person working on that. Whereas, you know, you watch one Michael Bay film and you can see that whatever he turns his hand to will turn to a pile of rubbish. <laughs> now, to be fair... I mean, it will, it will transform into a pile of rubbish. Sorry. To be fair, when Michael Bay is on, on point, he is very on point. Like, when you're thinking when is he on point? Con Air, The Rock... Oh, he did Con Air. I did not Armageddon. Know that. Don't want to close my eyes. Don't want to fall asleep. Oh yeah, yeah. Because all of those, all of those are okay. I would, I would very much want to debate you on that because I think Con Air is a certified masterpiece. <laughs> Maybe that's different. Then. Maybe it's that he had success with some things early on in his career and then, and then got lazy and just started doing the same thing over and over again. Once it was established, I think that's the big problem. Is basically when it turned to the Transformer movies is when he lost that that fire, that spark in his yeah. films. I and think. then, of course, because that's a franchise, they're doing five of them. They've got five of them in the pipeline. Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, he's done, he's done bits and pieces. I still want to watch Pain and Gain. Um, that's supposed to be absolutely awful <laughs> yeah but that kind of piques my interest in it um but yeah i don't think i've actually seen any movies by jean-pierre Genet after amelie um so i've watched delicatessen city of lost children and alien resurrection and then amelie but um but i've never watched for instance a very long engagement um which also starts no. with tattoo um and he released one this year or it's coming out this year for 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 netflix I was just um, looking at this. Yeah, it's a big bug. Yeah. <laughs> if that's going to be translated into something else. But this, this looks fantastic. Disappointingly not a Kafka um, adaptation. <laughs> big bug. <laughs> big bug. Um, yeah, which is, I, I guess, it's, it's, it's like a weird, quirky sci-fi movie about a robot uprising, but everything's kind of like pastel shaded um and strange so yeah it sounds interesting yeah it looks really I, good i definitely need to watch it i didn't even realize it was a thing so um yeah that's something that, that i need to watch but um but yeah amelie is obviously he's had success up to this point delicatessen was a was a cult hit city of lost children alien resurrection was not particularly well thought of but like i said i think 
better than people give it credit for. But then this was the big one. Yeah. And he's involved um, in the writing a lot of the time as well, most of yes. the time, which is always, I think, a sign of a, a good director as well. Not that you have to be involved in the writing, but it's generally but a good thing. Having that collaboration involved in it, I think, yeah. can, can create really interesting things. So with Emily, he, he wrote the story, but then let someone else do the screenplay, which is oh, usually tends to work, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so this is a story about uh, a young woman in Paris who decides to be like a a guardian angel type character for the people around her. So doing lots of interesting things like um, it's it starts with in her apartment finding a box of toys and knickknacks from someone who used to live there years and years and years ago. It's somewhere between it. fairy godmother, catfish, and yeah that's about it the joker the joker yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> going going on these like taking these people through these strange treasure treasure hunts to find these things or or pulling pranks on people who deserve it but never doing anything that's genuinely like gonna kill them <laughs> but no. just, just doing things that like they they deserve something bad to happen to them and then she she messes with their lives a little bit um and so it's a really interesting setup because it actually takes a while to get into the romantic angle here, where a lot of it is focused on her growing as this sort of um, well-being vigilante, I yeah. guess is the best way to put it. Um, it does. It's almost, it's quite slow, isn't it? It almost takes yeah. the first hour to get going. I, I felt much more compelled in the second half. When, when the love came in. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot of the first half of the movie is set up. So it spends a fair bit of time at the beginning on her childhood and getting you to understand who she is as a character and how she's developed um, before it then gets into, you know, she works as a waitress at a cafe and um, and and that's when it gets into her putting a little finger in people's lives and swirling it around a bit to give them a little bit of something that they deserve. And it's, yeah, it's it's done in a really interesting way, and sort of it's all framed around a narrator who sort of, when you're introduced to key characters, it'll tell you what their likes and dislikes are or some key facts about them. Yeah, which, which sort of lurches from being funny and interesting to being sort of tedious and like quirky for the sake of it and a bit tedious and sometimes it hits and sometimes it doesn't for me i don't know if you found that yeah for for me i think it 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 hits more than it misses but i can see where it might become a bit tedious when it's done the same thing for the nth time over the course of the movie um and because the main the reason that people don't like this, I think it's it's a, it's a it's a critically acclaimed and really popular film um, it, globally as well as in its home country of France. But the the criticism you often hear is that it's it's one of these kind of self consciously kooky and quirky films, isn't it? That tends to turn people off, which I don't yeah. think is fair. But I can understand that criticism. I I can understand people thinking that it's overly quirky, but I think it it justifies its quirkiness, and I think there's actually enough darkness and mystery in this film to keep it being driven along there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of death and pain woven into this kooky story this isn't a manic pixie dream girl nonsense film no but you you could be forgiven for thinking that it is but yeah but with when in, within the first 10 minutes you get to see her mother get killed by someone falling off a church on top of her it's kind of yeah it is it, very it, dark and at times it, the darkness feels at odds with the tone of the film but it but it's the the story is so well done that it works, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and it's a big part of his directorial style. So Delicatessen, um, City of Lost Children, and actually even um, even Alien Resurrection have this kind of absurd slapstick element to them where it really clashes between the dark, like darkness and then bits of humour here and there. And so it's actually, yeah, something that he uses quite a lot in his films. Um and so it, it's nice to see those stylistic elements. And for me, it works pretty much all the time, I think. The 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 sudden moments of like, this is someone's husband who, who ran off of somebody else, but I'm going to fabricate a load of letters that got lost in the Alps in a plane crash, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, that one felt the most catfishy to me. That one I thought was a perhaps, I mean, there probably wouldn't be any repercussions because the guy's probably long dead, but that still felt a bit un- the most kind of unfair to me. 
yeah and i think that's that's one of the key points of this film is i think it does debate the idea about whether what she's doing is right or wrong i think an awful lot um and then when the tables get turned and someone doesn't play along the way that she wants you can see that kind of panic there where she's not this master weaving a spider web around people it is kind of this chaotic thing that's going along because a lot of the times when she's playing the games with with nino who's the male love interest um played by Mattia kasovitz who is actually um the director of la haine speaking yes, of other that's iconic right. French films yeah <laughs> um which is it always really interests me because you know he's this incredibly talented director um who also he acts in stuff as well and is a good actor it's such a a strange mix of a career and he he basically he he's been directing uh since basically since he's been acting and yeah it's really interesting that that's been the sort of career he's had yeah and it's good is the thing yeah yeah and and he's good um we saw him very briefly in the fifth element that's right yeah um, <laughs> where, <laughs> where he's um he he's the sort of guy trying to rob uh bruce willis yeah and um, he also appears in valerian and the city of a thousand planets which is one we've oh, been talking amazing. about for a long time <laughs> we need to we need to watch that at some point which looks we like really sort do. of the fifth element but much more chaotic and and all over the place and i'm yeah, definitely and, here for that <laughs> and whenever um whenever cara delavine ends up in a movie you always know something interesting is going to come out of it yeah um the interesting thing about his 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 sort of career as a director is that he's done he's also done all sorts of weird stuff because la hen is this real gritty look at um at poverty in in paris and racism in paris and it's a really stark powerful film um but then he's also done like horror movies like gothica yeah which is a, <laughs> I've I, seen that. Do you, have you seen gothica i've yeah, seen that when it came out Barry. yeah um and then he's done a, a sci-fi action movie with um with vin diesel babylon ad was one of his films um it's again such a really varied career it's just fascinating when these directors do take all of those risks and do different things. Uh, but he's good here as the as the as the male lead. Um, you know, a, a lot of this movie is very much driven by um, Audrey Tattoo as Amelie. Um, great, she's, great performance, like, and she's iconic in, performance. Yeah, she's absolutely incredible in this film. Um, you know, really captures the energy and the essence of what the movie needs to be about. But it's worth noting that actually. Um, the supporting cast is really, really good here as well. Yeah. Um, you know, Mattia Kasovitz is really good as the um as 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 the, the, the romantic interest. But then you've got um Amelie's dad as well. There's no one um, who's letting the side down, is there? No, no. Uh you've got the glass man played by Serge Merlin. Serge Merlin. That that's yeah. what I want to be called. <laughs> that's you should just change your name to Serge Merlin. Hi, I'm Serge Merlin. Um, the wizard as well as um you know i think you've got you've got like jamel de Booz, um who's the the grocer's assistant and then um uh, urban conseiller as the grocer yeah that whole thing is very very funny isn't it that yes, that's what brings yeah. the most levity to it to it how, how genuinely awful like the grocer is to him all of the time and then he gets his revenge on him in sort of quite light-hearted and sweet ways that, that's quite a nice subplot that at times it, almost threatens to take over the main plot doesn't it yeah it does um yeah it it it's it it nearly takes over the main plot in places because you do feel as though there is this it, the funniest moments in this movie are where amelie fucks with the grocer <laughs> yeah. like genuinely hilarious and he completely deserves it because he's a, a vile human being um but it's yeah it's really well done um, she tries to he tries to call his mother on the phone and it's the psychiatric helpline which yes could be very very dark in another context <laughs> but here again it's that that blend of the darkness and the the humor works really well and i think that's where i think that's where jean pierre genet really i think i think he's very good at blending the two in a quirky way and and, and it working um so yeah, it's it's a 
I, I think everybody in this film, like I said, they do a really good job, but obviously it is very much driven by Audrey Tattoo, who's just fantastic. Absolutely yeah, fantastic. Yeah, a great performance considering that she doesn't actually talk much, does she? No, no. It's very, very action driven, not in terms of there being Michael Bay explosions, <laughs> but there's a lot of movement in this movie. Yeah, it's um, more about what she's doing than what she's saying, but we get a lot of narration. There's a lot of voiceover stuff, isn't there? You, the first 15 minutes is just narrated of it going through her almost her entire childhood. And you you think, oh, is the whole film going to be like that? And the narrator sort of pops up at key moments. But a lot of the time, you're just following her around doing stuff and also watching TV. There's a number of scenes where she's watching TV and sort of fantasizing about her life and how it would put, would play on TV and in a film. But she's not the one talking, is she? No, no. Yeah, there's a she gets a lot of work out of and a lot of emotional power out of that lack of you know it's it's very show don't tell which is always what you want to see in a movie even um, though it feels like you're being told everything because there's a lot of in-depth narration it's not yeah. telling you how to think it's not telling you what to think about it is it it's not telling the plot to you it's just telling you about the characters it's telling the characterization to you i guess yeah, the narration is very much about the the character side of things rather than the story elements. But even then, when it's talking about the character things, it's it's not going like, she's very sad. It's like giving additional, even very, very specific elements of someone's emotional setup at that moment in time. Or it's giving that kind of con- contextual thing about the situation or about something in history. So it all helps build your understanding about what the character is, which is then a supplement to the physical acting of the character a lot of the time. So it's, yeah, it's really, it's really well done. There's nothing else quite like it in terms of the way that it sets things up. No, I haven't seen anything like this in a very long time or anything that's kind of comparable, really. Yeah, I, 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 and I don't necessarily think that someone else could pull it off the, as successfully as this. In in French or any other language, do you think? No, no, because it's such a such a heady blend of the way that it's directed, the way that it's acted, and the way that it's written all intertwined together. That I don't think if if you took any of those elements out, it would fall apart. Yeah, absolutely. But it's when all three of them are together it successfully manages to pull off something quite unique. And it has that energy, doesn't it? You can feel like, you feel like that at a lot of turns. You're like, this film is about to fall af- apart in front of my eyes. But then suddenly it's onto the story with Nino and you're like, oh, it's great. And I'm really, really invested in that. It's, yeah. But it, you feel like it's walking a tightrope a lot of the time, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. It is always walking a tightrope. And then I love that it almost becomes like a, like a heist movie for the finale where it's her trying to pull off this big plot and it's all wrapped up in the mystery of who is this weird guy who keeps having his photo taken in photo booths yeah and so it is almost like a mystery film at that point and the mystery of that was actually very compelling and very very cool and you could almost have made that into a separate film couldn't you it could have Mm. that is a a bit that really really drives the ending of the film but actually that could have been its own little mystery film in and of itself couldn't it yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 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 a it's a cute little mystery story, and again, there are these moments of darkness in terms of what the characters think this person could be who keeps having his photo taken at the photo booth. He's a a man terrified of aging, or he's an immortal being he, as well. Is one of the things that gets talked about. Yeah, he's a ghost, um, or, yeah. and 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 yeah, he's a ghost and everything like that. And in the end, the simple thing is he's the. He's the repairman. Yeah, he's the <laughs> he guy. To test out that it's working, he takes a photo and then abandons it when he's done. Um, Which is extremely pedestrian, but also the perfect solution to it, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's this wonderful moment of simplicity that breaks down all of the romanticism up to that point uh, with just a really simple response. And when Nino realises that, you, the, his reaction, it's a perfect moment of acting, as you can see on his face that he loves that. And you're like, oh, you're really happy for him that he's discovered that and not that it's it's not something that's like a big disappointment to him. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, with some people, it could feel like a um, could feel like a letdown in another movie. You can imagine if you set it up as this big, this big mystery and then that's the reveal that it could be something that um, 
that people are disappointed in. Um, but instead, because of the way that it's all framed, and because of the way that there's all of this unnecessary complexity interwoven throughout the entirety of Emily's story, having that simple just like finger click of this is what it is, and it's something really mundane that you haven't thought of. It's just like, oh, it's it's like um it, it's like just a an instant relief from a headache almost, isn't it? The way that it feels when it all gets revealed. Yeah. And then we can get on to the romance. Yeah, and then and then they can um they can have a kiss and then ride about on his moped without helmets on. Very bad. Of course not. Nobody in France wears a helmet. <laughs> They're just there smoking cigarettes. Drinking red wine and getting yep. in mopeds and driving around. <laughs> <laughs> but and also, you know, they they've never even spoken to each other, but then they're immediately in love, and you believe that, don't you? Because of the way it's been set up and the way it's been intertwined with that story, and you get the moments of him. He's kind of she's been asking about him in the shop where he works, and then after he sort of she she's led him on yet another wild goose chase, and he's come back to the shop, and he's he's sort of asking what she's like, is she pretty, that kind of thing, but not in like a creepy way, in a way where he's genuinely interested. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that this movie really does is it sets up that people, everyone's got a thing. That's that's kind of the the, the framing of this movie yeah. is everyone's got a thing that they do. So Emily's like which can thing. be explained by your childhood. Yeah, and, and uh, very Freudian. Yeah, Freud would have Freud would have loved Emily. One thing you got to do if you get a time machine, go back in time, show him Emily. Yeah, he'd and be, he'd be like, rolling in, around on the floor, laughing and congratulating himself. And that'll just be because of the cocaine, to be honest yeah. with you. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, the, everyone's got a thing, which is which is a very funny Limmy sketch. I don't know if you've ever seen the Limmy sketch about what's your thing. Oh, I don't know if I have, no. It's very, it's very good. It's, it's just Limmy going, what's your hang to people? And then them all explaining that they've all got a little thing that they do that no one else does. <laughs> Um, it's really, really good. Have a look. Oh, is it I'm like sure in the in the street? No, no, no. It's all um, it's all it's all actors and characters. Oh, okay. it's, it was on Limmy's show. It's very funny. Um, but um, but yeah, everyone's got a thing that they do. So so Emily's this fixer. Nino collects these photographs of of, of people from photo booths. Um, one of the other characters, one of the other waitresses, um, collects sayings and proverbs. Um, but the one thing that it brings up, and and it's really interesting, is the way that actually Nino and Emily, the way that they frame this thing that they do, this compulsion that they have, is in a very similar way. Yeah. So, so without the movie directly telling you that they're soulmates, like a Disney movie, instead you get that vibe throughout the whole of the movie after he's been introduced yeah um that it doesn't you you know they're going to be together forever at the end of the film don't you essentially yeah of course and you you feel it in the way that they both go about their business and go about their things in a way that you have seen in other romantic comedies before you know where you've got male is kind of along those lines i guess where obviously they're writing to each other it's a bit more explicit but it's still kind of them taking instead of doing that build up to them actually meeting face to face and then when that becomes the story you're compelled because you've been given all that kind of Freudian stuff, haven't you? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, um, yeah, it, it, the, the the framing here is very much the same, like you said, to that kind of classic rom-com setup of these two people who, when are they going to properly meet? When are they going to properly get together? And he, they keep that that wheel turning throughout. And they drag it out as well, because there's, uh, yeah. there's points where... He he goes to the cafe and she's there and she says is, he holds up the picture of her in the Zorro mask that she's done um, as part of the wild goose chase and he goes is this you and she lies and you can tell she doesn't want to you're thinking and you you want to shout just talk to him man just talk to him but then you realise that you know the the payoff that comes later works cinematically even though at that point you're like just get on with it yeah yeah and it, it, it's. The, the the reason that it works there as well is not just because of the romantic framing of, you know, wanting to drag it on a bit more, but also because once again, this is the this is the breaking of the facade that she's been building, this treasure hunt she's been building where he's very direct and is like, Is this you? Whereas the way that she wants to do it is something a little bit more 
complex and and mysterious. Yeah, and it's almost like she doesn't know how to make that part as complex and mysterious as the other stuff. It's like, well, it all leads up to that, but then what now? You know, it's like she never Absolutely. wants to break the yeah. illusion. Yeah, and and so it's, I think it's really well framed that it does have these moments where reality tries to break into the situation and every time it's like no we can't be having that we're going to go back into the 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 play acting yeah back into the plotting which is good because uh, uh, there are lots of fantastical moments woven throughout the film aren't there bits of where like she literally melts into water or yeah there's those bits where she's the film sequences where she's imagining her own funeral or those kinds of things it has quite a few weird little moments like that but when reality intrudes upon it, it helps actually to ground it, doesn't it? And to make it not seem like a film that's overly concerned with whimsy at the expense of other things. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's that's the that's the thing, isn't it? It's like you said, it's that tightrope to walk. It's that balancing act, and I think it manages to get that balance and acts right there. Yeah, absolutely. Even though she's um, kind of a catfish. Even though she's kind of a catfish. Have you ever watched the movie Catfish? I watched it with you at your house. Did we watch it together? A long time ago. Oh. And this is about 2010, 2011, I think. God, yeah. that was a long time ago. Yeah. And you, that- you had the DVD. I'd never seen it before. I knew nothing about it and didn't know what the term meant or anything. And I was like, wow, I was blown away by it. Yeah, that that's um, that's the thing, isn't it? Is obviously the term came from the film. Yeah. Um. And yeah, that's another movie where the the mystery is far more mundane than what you think it's going to be. Yeah. I suppose, actually, thinking about it. That's why it works. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, did it, have you ever watched the TV show? Yeah, before? yeah, we watch it all the time. It's one of those things, if you're sort of channel hopping <laughs> and there's nothing on, you'll end up, we'll often end up on that, because it seems to be always on. It's either New Ones or Repeats or Catfish UK, which isn't bad either. Oh, I've never seen... Is, is it still the same fellas? yeah. Oh, oh no no it's di- no sorry it's different people in the UK. Oh okay. That's slightly disappointing. I think they should have come over here to do it. Yeah. No um and on the the US one Max has left but Neve is still there. Uh, okay. Okay. I wonder what Max has gone off to do. Yeah, I don't know. I think he's like a successful director now and he might oh, have done yeah. some films and stuff. The other two people who were involved in the original Catfish movie, by the way, are successful directors, and they in fact directed the third Paranormal Activity movie. Oh, okay. Little little factoid for you. Um, one thing to note about Amelie, it's got Joseph Stalin in it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did notice that. Who they they overdub him on some? It's like a documentary or something they're talking about, isn't it? And he's talking about Amelie. Yeah, um, it's, that that's a weird moment. <laughs> a lot of those TV sequences are really weird. There's one with, with yeah. um, Serge Merlin where he's watching Sister Rosetta Tharp as well. Interestingly, mm. who's there's a good um, good link back to Elvis last week. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. All of those all of those sequences are really strange, um, but they add a lot. It's kind of hypnotic, isn't it? All of those 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 moments where it's that that sort of magic realism element. Um, and and you know that it's always imagination, you know, you know that this isn't really going on, but it does add to this fantastical view of Paris that this movie sort of emulates, because this is not a realistic depiction of Paris. No, I don't, and I don't think it's trying to be. <laughs> no, no, it's very, <laughs> it's very much this, this dreamland version of Paris, but I think that it's fine for the, for the situation that it's in and for, for the story it wants to tell. I don't think it... You, Things don't always have to be real. It's quite nice to have things that are more of a fantasy every now and again. No, of of, of course. And that, I think it has been criticised along those lines, hasn't, hasn't it, for presenting this sort of idyllic ideal of Parisian society. But it's not trying to be that. It's a fantasy. It's quite clearly a fantasy and a whimsical piece. Yeah, one, one interesting piece of criticism I read was people saying that this movie's too white, um, which is... It's white. Which is weird because the... Um, uh, Matthew Kasovitz is um, half Jewish, so you, you've actually got a, 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 a half Jewish romantic lead in this movie, and the most sympathetic character is um, Moroccan. So it's like, oh, okay, Lucian, well, the um, yeah. yeah, the grocer's assistant, yeah, that's the right. grocer's assistant. It's like, well, okay, no, it's not, it, it's not particularly white. <laughs> to be perfectly honest um so yeah that was a weird a weird bit of um 
criticism thrown its way, which maybe feels a little bit performative. Yeah, absolutely. Be, Pe- people don't honest. like successful things that are whimsical. No, no, exactly, exactly. Um, and they'll always whereas, find something to hate about it. Yeah, and and you know that I'm generally not a fan of whimsy, but I think this movie does it so well. You, you, you're a fan of whimsy when it's French, I think, is what we've learned today. <laughs> the whimsy? Yeah. The, well, the French can get away with, with doing stuff, can't they? <laughs> you mean just like, in general? <laughs> just in general. If a Frenchman came into my house right now and just just made himself a cup of tea, I'd be like, oh, it's, it's yeah, French. Yeah, it's just, just, just let him do it. It's fine. Just let him do it. I mean, it would be a coffee rather than a tea. Yeah, though, yeah. Of course. I don't, they don't drink the tea that much. No, everyone in this film is drinking coffee at the, the coffee bar where she works that also has a massive cigarette counter in it, which we don't have. Yeah, those. like a tabac. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but they have a very French it's, thing. Yeah, is, which is, yeah, incredibly it, it, French. It, extremely French. I don't know if it's still a thing. I've not been to France in a few years. No. Whether the tobacco culture is still such an intrinsic part of that kind of communal place like a cafe. Me neither. But it always it always used to be a huge thing that like you'd have the the massive tobacco section of a cafe that also sold like lollipops for kids. Yeah, like yeah, that. I remember going to a lot of those when I went as a kid and other times. In fact, if I'm remembering the last time I went there, I walked into a place that looked exactly like that to get some coffee. So yeah, I think that is definitely. This was probably <laughs> yeah. five years ago, maybe. I went for an academic conference. Um, and then I got stuck there because there were um, protesters on the Eurostar, so I couldn't get back. And my insurance ah, okay. company wouldn't pay out for the very expensive hotel I had to book into. So that was fun. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> lovely. How but nice extra day in Paris. So nothing wrong with that. But an extra day in Paris and you got to go and spend some time in a nice cafe. I, but it, it does. It, it looks like a kind of quintessential french cafe yeah it? but i i have to say i kind of hated the subplot with the, the guy who's like creeping on both of the women in there and um, with this tape recorder i kind of hated that and just found him creepy and horrible well i think you're meant to find him creepy and horrible yeah but i didn't find that compelling i i, I would have been quite happy for <laughs> okay. that to have been cut from the film and then that well, would have cut I, it down I, to I, a more manageable hour and 45 probably <laughs> yeah because because it is two hours yeah. long it is quite a long movie for, for the kind of movie it is um i i quite enjoy it because it's another sign that actually she shouldn't be meddling as much as she should be and instead she's she's maybe brought these two people a moment of joy that may or may not be deserved but you see the negative long-term impacts on the woman in particular yeah because it ends um, in quite a negative way doesn't it yes yeah the the writer threatens to beat yeah. up um, and she and she she runs out um but um but yeah so I, I i i think i think it's important from a breaking her out of her dream state perspective right of actually re- recognizing that you know what what she's been doing in terms of meddling in other people's lives isn't always the right thing to do and yes it's been successful sometimes but equally it's about recognizing other people as human beings rather than playthings. and i think that's kind of where it was going what it was going for but i can see what you mean about it feeling uncomfortable i think maybe it's that guy's face i just maybe i really don't like his face <laughs> so i guess job done well, you need to, for him but yeah you, you need to watch alien resurrection which he's also in where he plays a far more sympathetic oh player. yes of course <laughs> everyone's more sympathetic <laughs> in alien well when you're when when you're up against horrifying xenomorph creatures it's basically the only bad people you can be are capitalists which is the main message of the the good alien movies is capitalism bad giant alien monsters also bad which is worse (laughs) which is worse there's only one way to find out (laughs) a bit of harry hill action (laughs) um which 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 it, it always it makes me laugh when you see idiots on the internet saying that alien's not political or or why are they trying to politicize alien it's like Uh, literally the first movie is about the horrors of capitalism and how far companies will go to get something that is worth at the expense of people. And it's exactly the same message in the second movie and in the third movie. Listen, you heard it here first. Everything's political. Everything is political. Amelie is political. It's got Stalin in it that <laughs> makes it political. <laughs> yeah. It's got a man oh, crying dear. in it that makes it political. <laughs> Things <laughs> political. 
A man crying is a political. It's got event. gnomes in it. Gnomes are political. <laughs> got accordions in it. Accordions are political. Everything's political. Did you like? Did you appreciate the music? I did. Yeah, it's a really, um, it's a really fun little, uh, it's a really fun little um, score. Lots of piano stuff, very French. A lot of French sounding accordion in terms of what you think of as a very, very cliched perception that we have of what France is like. It's always accompanied by that kind of accordion music, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. That's what, when you think of France, that's what you think of, isn't it? Yeah. The sort of stereotypes of France. Yeah. And I think it kind of knows that, doesn't it? And I, I'm going to say that I think that's part of the reason this film was a huge international success is because of the accordions. Oh, well, absolutely. I agree. I think the whole package of this movie, you know, framing France in a way that's palatable for people who maybe only recognise France from the stereotypes, um, I think it I think is a big reason why it was successful, because there there's that romanticism of France and romanticism of Paris is incredibly popular and people want to buy into it. And so I think the fact that they did this in this movie is a big reason why it was so successful. And in the early 2000s, this film was everywhere, wasn't it? It won every award going and people were really, really talking about it as some kind of like real watershed moment in French cinema and in terms of French cinema being played abroad as well. And it's it, you can see why when you watch it, but I still think that's very, very interesting because there were lots of things that came before that perhaps didn't get the same acclaim. Mm, yeah, it it is interesting. Um, one thing to note is that it was nominated but didn't win any of the best foreign language. Uh, it, it was nominated for best foreign language film, uh, best original screenplay, um, art direction, cinematography, and sound at the Oscars. Interesting, year, but did not win. They won a couple of Baftas, I see. Yeah, so it it did win quite a lot as well, um, but um, but yeah, No Man's Land was the movie that won in two thousand and one, which I've never heard of. No, nope, I've never heard of that either. Uh, Bosnian war film about the Bosnian um, a Bosnian film about the Bosnian war. Okay, well, that's not really a fair comparison, is it? I mean, like, <laughs> that highlights and the ridiculousness of the Oscars, doesn't it? And and it really does. You know, obviously having a category that's exclusively for non-English language movies is... They're all, gonna, they're all the same, yeah. E- every film that's not in English, <laughs> it's all the same. It's, it's good to be able to give a specific prize to a non-English language film to help promote it with people who maybe wouldn't have seen it otherwise. Yes, it's a net good, but at the same, good, time, at the, that is at the ridiculous. same time, how can you compare a Bosnian war film to Amelie? <laughs> you know, how can you watch those two and decide which one's better than the other? There's darkness in both, there's light in both. Or in the case of the, the, the Oscar deciders, they probably only watched one of them. <laughs> I guess that's a big problem with the Oscars, isn't it? It turns out that a lot of the time they can't be bothered to actually watch all of the films that they're meant to watch before they vote on them. Well, I mean, it is just the one guy called Oscar. I mean, there's only so much time he's got. <laughs> there are only so many hours in the day. There's only so much time, isn't there? It's true. It's true. <laughs> Mr. Oscar. Mr. Oscar, the decider of all. Um, so um, how are we going to uh, rate this? Um, let's see. I, I just have one other thing I want to say, which is that her dad was lovely, and I love that he wants to see the world like Charles the robot from Brian and Charles. And then at the end, he gets in <laughs> the taxi the and goes off to see the world like his gnome. That was lovely. So, and I love that, even though I hate gnomes. <laughs> gnomes are the worst. I, I my hate dad them. loves gnomes. Does he? Yeah, oh, he's no. got loads of them. I don't think um, me and your dad could be friends anymore. <laughs> Can we get? I know we talked about a, uh, a crossover between Brian and Charles and Ex Machina. Should we get Amelie's dad into the mix? Yeah, as well? yeah. Have a little trio on holiday. Comes across a, French, a lovely old French man in Honolulu, just chilling out. Yeah, that would be great. I think they'd, he, they'd he work can be like really the well. emotional dad moment for the romance between the two robots. Ah, oh, yeah. He can he can give each of them in turn what they need to hear about the other one. Yeah. This is good. Exactly. I like where this is going. Yeah, no, that's that's what we should do. <laughs> um, yeah, give so. us the rights. We want to write this movie. Give us the rights to three characters from three very different films. 
Hon- the, the, the movie's called Honolulu, but the two L's are ones because they're robots. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the O's are zeros. It's bi- no binary code. I see what you did exactly. there. Exactly, yeah. That's probably it. That's actually binary code for something else, isn't it? Tell us, nerds, what that is. <laughs> oh, dear. So, yeah, any, anything else you want to add? Or, uh, no, that, I, I think that was it. Cool. Um, yeah, shall we... How are we going to rank this one, then? Let's um, see. How, how many... No, you. How you many? Go. How many horrible pranks are you pulling on a nasty green gracer? Oh, many, many, many of those. I'm going to pull seventeen of a possible twenty. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm just going to go one higher on eighteen. Wow, that's that's high. That's a high score. It's, uh, deserved, I think. Deserved. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't know if I will be rewatching this anytime soon. It's like. I think it's bits of it are really, really going to stay with me for a while, but the, yeah, it's not necessarily like it's one I'll probably watch like once every ten to twenty years, and then have have a big emotional reaction to, and then that'll be it. Yeah, I used to watch this quite a lot, but then I haven't watched it in quite a few years now. Probably not in about five years. Um, but maybe it'll go back into the repeat viewing again. Maybe. So in the last few years, you've probably watched more films with Hero Finds Tiffin in than you've watched this. <laughs> I absolutely have, and I know what's coming next. <laughs> Which I apologise for, but yes, After Ever Happy um, is here. So, you know, that's the fourth film <laughs> in this, this series that refuses to die. So is is this another sequel? Is it a prequel? This is the last of the kind of the main story, and I read that there's they're working on a prequel and potentially another sequel as well, but I think oh there are four God. books, and these are all the ones based on the four books, okay. as far as I can tell. Okay, so we're, ne- <laughs> we're nearly through it. It's just this one, and then potentially some others. Yeah, so we. But later down the line, <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, we've we've talked about all of the other three, so we can link you to those. But yeah, after ever happy is is free on Prime Video, so that's what we're doing next. <laughs> and then it'll be Christmas, so it'll be fine. This is just bridging that gap. <laughs> it's the most <laughs> wonderful time of the year. I, you I started know I that can't too low, and I can of, <laughs> of hero find Stephen. <laughs> I knew oh, that. Dear. <laughs> well thank you very much for tuning in we really really appreciate it appreciate it and if you haven't seen amelie go watch it it's it's a lovely french film um and if you have seen it before why not watch it again revisit it yes yeah go and give it, give it a watch particularly if you've not seen um not seen it before and it's quite different to a lot of the stuff we've been talking about so far it's something that's very very far removed from the chaos of today's world you know it's it's good from that point of view and it's on netflix as well yeah yeah no uh, uh go go give it a watch whilst it's on there all right there is a link in our show notes to where you can give us money like a virtual tip jar you can still find us on twitter somehow at big boys don't pod you can email us big boys don't cry podcast at gmail.com and we'll be back next week to talk about after ever happy au revoir au revoir